Praise God. We're going to be reading out of Ezekiel this morning. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 16 through 28. Starting in verse 16, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a removed woman. Now, I don't mean to get PG-13 on you, but that's the Bible. And I'm preaching the Bible this morning. And so I just want to give a little bit of an explanation there. In the Old Testament, in the Levitical law, when a woman was on her menstrual cycle, she was considered to be unclean. But not only that, just about everything that she touched. And I'm not, that, this, that, that, this is a symbol and a type of what was to come. And so the, the word of God, just like leaven or yeast was a sign of sin. Leprosy was a sign of sin. In the Old Testament law, this was a sign of uncleanness. Okay, it's not to, it doesn't have the same connotation today that it did then. It was a spiritual connotation. And everything that she touched was unclean for a period of time. So what the Lord is likening it to is, is that it, because, because the, they, they would also have to be removed from the presence of the congregation. People wouldn't, weren't, weren't able to be able to touch. There had to be a time of separation while they went through this particular period, right? And what the Lord is saying in this particular situation is that when he had made his own people that were called by his name, when they began to defile and go according to their own way, which means a path or a road or a particular direction or their own doings which describes their behavior and their character that it was unto him as a woman who is removed or in the midst of her uncleanness and therefore has to be separated from the presence of the congregation see God's presence can't dwell with man's sin that's right Amen. It's very important that you and I understand that in our own walk with the Lord God's presence is not okay with disobedience in the midst of our life and it goes on to say this, that wherefore I poured my fury upon them for the blood that they had shed upon the land and for their idols wherewith they had polluted it. And I scattered them among the heathen and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered unto the heathen, that means I I drove them out of their own land and their own country, and I dispersed them amongst the world. See, that's still relevant for you and I today. We're going to get into it in a moment. But they had been dispersed. He didn't allow them to stay in that safe place that he had prepared for them because of the disobedience of their life. He, allowed, he caused them to be moved towards the world where they began to dwell and became intermingled with the world. They're still his people. But because of their disobedience, they've been moved into a place where now they're intermingling with the world or they're living in the midst of their world. He says, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way and according to their doings, I judged them. And when they entered unto the heathen, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord and they're gone forth out of his land. But I had pity for my holy name. I want to repeat that again. I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, wherever they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the heathen wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which you have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified or separated or be made to look holy in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. I want to take just a second right here because see what he's talking about now is he's making a promise about the new covenant. 
Ezekiel is looking forward through the Holy Spirit 600 years before Jesus would ever be born. And he's saying, I'm going to sprinkle clean water upon you. I've done a lot of teaching about this in the past. But this water of cleansing is the ashes of the red heifer. This whole heifer, it was a red heifer, symbolic of blood, and it was killed differently. The blood was not drained out. The blood was not sprinkled. Instead, the whole animal was killed and then burned, and the blood contained in the ashes. And then again, a pinch of the ashes was placed in some cleansing water of purification, and then it was sprinkled. And this is a type of the new covenant. This is a symbol of the new covenant, the new testament, where Jesus was going to come and is dying on the cross and the shedding of his blood was going to allow cleansing for the people of God. Because look what he goes on to say. From He says, I'm going to sprinkle you with clean water. With the, I'm going to sprinkle you with blood. You could say that. And you shall be clean. I'm here to tell you this morning that the work that Jesus has come to do will clean your heart, will clean up your life, and will clean up my life if we will submit our lives to him and allow him to move and to operate in the midst of us. This is how I can tell you that this is that this is New Testament. He says, you shall be clean from all your filthiness, from all your idols. I will cleanse you. Look at this. A new heart will I give you. Amen. See, in the new covenant, there's a promise that when you get saved, whenever you have heard the truth of the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you will be given the revelation that Jesus died for you and you will re you will respond by faith and submit your life to him. The Holy Spirit comes in and he renews. The New Testament talks about a circumcision of the heart and how he does a surgical procedure and how he creates a new heart on the inside. See, that's what you and I need. We don't need a new church. I mean, sometimes we do. We don't need a new church. We don't need a new. We don't need a new. A new relationship. We don't need a new high. We don't need a new something to take our eyes and distract us from. No, what we need is a new heart. We need a new heart from the Lord, and only the Holy Spirit can create in us a new heart. The King David, who was called by the Lord in a type of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, found himself on a rooftop when he was supposed to be at war with the king. <laughs> And when he sinned against the Lord, and whenever the Lord got a hold of his heart and he came to the realization that he had failed God, then the prayer in, 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 in Psalm 51 was, Lord, create in me a clean heart. I need you to do a creative miracle on the inside yes, of me, Lord, Lord. Because I'm, I'm, I'm weary and I'm, and I'm wandering and I'm going in a direction that is opposite of your will and I need you to do a work on the inside of me. I need you to do a creative miracle, God. Amen. Listen to me, church. This isn't just like, let's play church. No, the word of the Lord says that he wants to create in us a clean heart. He wants to create in us. He wants to do a miracle in us. Yes. He wants to make us a new Creation. He says, also, I will give you a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Is it okay if I just preach this morning? Is it okay Amen. if I just tell the truth? That sometimes the people of God have a stony heart. Yes. Lord, no, sometimes the preacher got a stony heart. Is it okay if we just be real with each other? Yes. Amen. Sometimes we got a stony heart, a hard heart. And we know the will of the Lord. Because we've heard the word of the Lord. But what we choose to do is to do our own thing rather than do the Lord's thing. Lord, help us. Yeah. Grab a hold of our hearts. Shake us and wake us, Lord, that we would do your will and not our own will. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. He says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments. I got good news for you, church. The new covenant and the message of the cross and the message of his sacrifice or Jesus Christ and him crucified, whatever your flavor of calling it is. The new covenant says that it's a completed work. Amen. Listen to me. Amen. Jesus said it is finished when yeah. he gave up the spirit. What that means is that not only did he forgive us of our sin, but he broke the back of the power of sin in our life. It's our job to begin to know the word of God. Number one, if you don't know the word of God, you can't believe in the word of God. Amen. But once you begin to know the word of God, you can now begin to believe the word of God. And for your everyday walk with God, I don't care what you're facing. I don't care what kind of powerful sin it is. I don't care what kind of situation it is. The work of the Lord is a completed work and when you will learn that and put your faith in that, it will release a flow of grace in your life that is stronger and bigger and more powerful than anything that the devil could ever throw at you. 
He said, I will cause you to walk according to my statutes. But I've been trying, Lord. I've been trying to walk for you. I've been trying to live for you. I've been trying to. That's the problem. You're trying to in your own strength. You can't do it. But when you come to the place where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, where you're tired of falling and failing, where you're tired of doing the same old thing and being stubborn against the Lord, hallelujah, and you just bow that knee and you throw your hands up and surrender, I'm telling you right now, the Lord will begin to move in your life and He will give you a strength because He's here Amen. to glorify His name. He's doing it for His own name's sake. Amen? Aren't you glad He's doing it for His own hallelujah. name's sake? Yeah. He's got a promise for you. He wants to give you victory. He says, you will keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. And you shall be my people. And I will be your God. Amen. My message is titled this morning, The New You Will Make Him Look Great. That's good. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your will, Lord God, and your will is that you would be glorified. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help me, Lord God, to preach the message that you've given me. Lord, I already know that it's your will because it's already been verified in the music and also in the word. Because you are indeed the door. You are indeed the door that opens the eyes, Lord, that we might be able to see. And I pray, Lord God, that you would go forth, that you would anoint your word. That it would reach deep down inside the hearts of your people and that you would speak to your own people that are called by your name. That you would let them hear what you desire to say to each and every one of them, Lord God. And that you would use me as a vessel, Lord, as imperfect as I am, more clay than I am, Lord God. You've chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. I pray that you'd move personality out the way and that you would allow your word to go forth. In Jesus' name we pray. At this point in the passage, you know, Israel is God's people. But once again, they had chosen to rebel and live a life of sin that had resulted in their deportation to Babylon, another country, their enemy. The text states that their ways and doings, in other words, their character and actions profaned God's name because the way they behaved contradicted the character of God. And when people viewed them, they were getting a picture of the God they claimed they serve. So in other words, when your character, my character, and our doings, our behavior is contrary to the character or the word of God, when people are looking at you, what they're seeing is, oh, okay, so this is what God looks like. Or this is what the people of God look like. I'm being real with you. Come on, somebody. The preacher, I've already said it. I'm not going to keep saying it. Just get it in your head. The preacher knows he ain't perfect. The preacher knows that he needs this message just as much for himself as what you need it. So don't let the don't let the enemy of your soul as this message goes forward because it's going it, it, it don't get no better than this. What I'm saying is, if anything, it's just going to get a little bit rougher as we move on because it's the word of the Lord. I didn't I didn't write it. God wrote it right here. Amen. But don't let the enemy lie to your spirit, man. Don't let the enemy lie to you and tell you, oh, that that this isn't God. That this doesn't feel right. No, what I'm here to tell you is that this feels exactly right because this is the word of the Lord and the enemy will try to whisper in your ear and he will try to tell you I don't like the way this makes me feel but I'm here to tell you there's nothing better than the feeling of the Lord when we respond to the truth of the gospel and the freedom and the liberty that it produces on the inside of our life. Amen. No, see, they used to, the people knew them from their past. The people that knew they used to serve the Lord. Because remember, even after they were moved out of the land, they still profaned his name where they were. You know, I imagine for the child of God, and I ain't here to pick on nobody, but I'm just saying, I imagine for the child of God, whenever, this is the, this is the context for you and I today. It's relevant for your life today. That you are the child of God. Israel, whenever he created them through Abraham and he finally brought them into the promised land. But then they allowed idols and pollution to come into their life. And they defiled the land. And what happened? He dispersed them outside of the land. That's like the child of God that has tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And then he's gone out into the world on his little journey out there. Right? Her little journey. And, and now that they're now that they're out there, but it ain't like nobody didn't know. Because whenever you were serving the Lord, you used to speak for the Lord, right? You used to let people know that you were a Christian. This ain't here to beat you up. I'm just here to tell the truth. And that even though now that we're out there in the world, they remembered. And, they, and it's still profaning the name of the Lord because we used to live for God, but now we're not living for God. And and listen, we can't just brush that under. It's a very important thing. It's a very reverential thing that we recognize the importance of the word of God and the character of God. Now, we can't do it in our own strength, church. 
ain't not one of us in this room that can do it in our own strength. We need the grace of God flowing in our life and strengthening us. If we're going to bring, if God's going to manifest his presence in our life and bring glory to his name, it's only going to be because we surrendered to the message of Calvary and that we allowed the Holy Spirit to infill us and to strengthen us and to produce in us the fruit that the Holy Spirit was to produce. That's what the word means, though. Profane, it means to wound or pollute. The people of God sometimes wound and pollute the name of the Lord. We've all done it. Even whenever we're not straight up backslidden, sometimes the decisions that we make and the way that we act and the things that we say, wound. come on somebody, help me out here. We wound and pollute the name of our God. God's not willing to leave his people in this condition where they bring shame on his name. If you ever find yourself in a church or a spiritual atmosphere that leaves you feeling comfortable with where you are and there hasn't been any true repentance or heartbreak over sin or a coming to the realization and desperation that if God doesn't change me, I won't make it, then you're not in the right place. Find yourself a preacher that will tell you the truth. Hallelujah. The truth is that God promises to do a work, give a gift of grace or power so that his people, I'm talking about those that want to live for him, even if it's just a tiny little whimper on the inside of your heart when you're lying in your bed at night and you know that you're far from the Lord and you've cried out, amen, and you might in your ear, your eyes might have even welled up with tears, but the real part of your heart is saying, Lord, I know I'm not right and I want to be right, even if it's just a little whimper and it's a whole lot smaller than all the disobedience in your life, God sees it and he knows that you want to live for him and that makes you his child, amen, hallelujah. He will be, they will be given strength so that they can, so that they can live for him, so that they can represent him. He explains that his purpose is so that the damage to his name can be repaired. When a sinner gets saved and allows God to change him or when a believer truly yields to the will and spirit of God, the change in the life becomes manifest for all to see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we're, how'd the song go? Whenever we're walking around, well, I know I'm doing a horrible job, but when we're walking around with our ra- hands raised in the air and the world wonders why, because we're here to give you glory, Lord. We're just here to worship you. Amen. We want our life to ring true of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yes. Listen, this all starts with repentance. Yes. The repentance opens the eyes. I was reading one of my devotionals from from Oswald Chambers the other day, and I kind of paraphrased it a little bit, but this is basically what he said. Repentance isn't the ransom that persuades God to forgive sin. Repentance is not the ransom. See, there was a ransom that was paid, but repentance isn't the ransom. Repentance is the door. That's why I knew I changed that word. He said avenue. I put the word door right there. I'm giving Oswald Chambers his due. It's his, it's his daily devotion. But I wanted to use the word door. And now the Lord revealed to me through the word that he's talking about a door this morning. The repentance is the door whereby God enables us to see. That our sinful condition is hopeless unless God does a remarkable work of grace and redemption in our lives. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. You don't have to turn there, but in John 1, 30 and 31, the scripture tells us that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And he came preaching the gospel in the wilderness and he became doing a baptism of repentance. Why? So that all should be made, so that Jesus should be made manifest to Israel. The door of repentance provides a door that opens our eyes to be able to see God, to make manifest, to make visible, to make known that which was unknown or hidden. Listen to me, church. You and I got to repent of our wayward self. We have to repent of our life. And that's just going to open up the door. And it's going to be able to allow us to see. The word repent literally means to change the mind or to change direction. If you and I are going to repent, that means we're not going to keep going in the same direction that we've been going. And we're going to quit thinking the way that we used to think. It's easy for us to get caught up and to become numb in the church. Listen. You know, like, well, man, dude, I don't smoke dope no more. I don't drink no more. I ain't running around no more. Okay, but what about other mindsets? What about other characteristics of our life that are contrary to the ways of God, contrary to the will of God, and still is causing a wedge 
and a separation between Lord. us and the Spirit of God. And it prevents us from hearing yeah. the voice of God the way that He wants us to hear Him. Yeah. Amen. That's the word of the Lord. Yeah. God's not okay with just a little bit. God sent Jesus to die and to lay his whole life down. And he's asking the same from us. Yeah. It's Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me. Yeah. Amen. God, Jesus wants to live his life through you. In order for him to live his life through you, you've got to be moved out the way. Hallelujah. Amen. He who wants to follow after me must deny himself and pick up his cross and follow after me. The Calvary produces death, amen? But listen, after the death, there comes a resurrection life. That's the will of God. That's the word of the Lord. God wants to produce resurrection life in you, amen? Listen, so repentance is not the ransom, but you know what else? Sorrow or remorse isn't repentance either. Oh, it's part of the process. Don't misunderstand me. But listen, Luke 15, the prodigal son... Right? How long was he in that condition? You know the story? If you don't know, just in case you don't know the story. The prodigal son. What was it? His father was wealthy. There was two boys. And one of the boys said, give me what belongs to me, father. And so his father, although he was heartbroken, he gave him what his share of the inheritance. And the scripture says that that young man went out to a far country and he spent all that he had on riotous living, prostitutes and all kinds of other stuff. And one day he found himself in the middle of a situation. And it sounds like it went on for a while where he realized he was eating hog food. He was feeding swine, which was not supposed to be done by a Jewish person. He wasn't even supposed to be close to pigs. That's another point. And he was literally feeding them. And he was so hungry, so destitute, had lost everything that was his, that his belly was a hungry for the hog slop. And he came finally to his senses and he said, Where, what am I doing? Oh my gosh, what has happened to me? I'm my own, the servants in my father's house live a better life than I'm living. I'm going to turn and I'm going to go back to my father. You see, I don't know how long he was in that sorrowful condition. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that there's people in this church, including sometimes things that I've done in the past, we're sorrowful. We have remorse over our sin. Ain't no true child of God that's got the Holy Ghost living in our heart that's okay and happy with sin. But Lord, help us. Just because we're remorsing, it's just because we're full of remorse and sorrowful, that's not repentance. No, you know what's repentance? He went back. He returned. He changed direction. He changed his mindset. He went back to his father, and that's repentance. For you and I to make the move where we change our mind and we move back into the Father's arms. And whenever we do that, the door is open. Our eyes are able to see the Holy Spirit begins to speak more clearly to us. And we can begin to grow and walk more closely with the Lord from that point moving forward. Sometimes we think we've returned because we're going to church more. Or we're witnessing. But have we really returned to the Lord? Only the, you and I know that. Only That's a work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Amen. That's not for anyone else to judge. But have we really submitted to His will? Or have we merely placed a veneer on the front to hide what's really yes. still there? It's not good enough for God. He wants it all. He wants control of the heart. Kind of strange that I put this in here. But I remember one time as an ICU nurse, a post-operative patient was coding. And we had to reopen his chest. And I was standing there. I know I've probably told this story before, but I was thinking about it when I was writing it. I was standing there with that man's heart in my hand. And I was over there. I was trying. That was what the heart surgeon said to do. Open his chest up, man. Grab his heart out of that chest cavity. Good. Squeeze it. I've never done that before. Squeeze it. And the point that I was trying to do was, was to, to try to allow blood flow to be made. It, it was a futile effort. I couldn't save that man. I'm here to tell you, though, that God's in the saving business. Amen. God's in the heart saving business. Amen. That's what he does. He saves lives and he wants our heart in his hand. Yes. He wants to be what makes our hearts beat. He's not OK with just a little bit of our lives. He's not OK with his people called by his name, staying connected to idols that pollute the land and pollute his name. Amen. Come on, child of God. Let me ask you a question. I'm about to list off some things here. What are these idols? They get in us and they pull us away from him. We are more focused on them than we are his will. Can I say that again? We, whenever we have idols in our life, I'm about to break it down for you. 
When we have idols in our life, it's anything that is in our life that draws our attention away from Jesus and puts them on that thing. I'm not talking about a statue of Mary in your front yard. That's, that could be that. False, that's just false religion. You ain't supposed to be elevating her. Lord help me. But that ain't even... You know, I used to get so frustrated with me because I'm like, dude, you over there, you over there tattooing Catholicism, and that's not even real Christianity. I'm not saying there's no real Christians in the church, in the Catholic Church. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm here to tell you the truth. You do not pray through Mary to get to Jesus. Mary was not born of a virgin. Mary did not uh, did not assume into heaven, ascend into heaven like Jesus did. But the Catholic Church teaches all that. That's another Jesus. The real Mary was a young maiden that was found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The real Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord my Savior. That means that Mary recognized that she needed a Savior for her sin. Amen. All I'm trying to say is this. God's not okay with idols that pollute the land and pollute his name. These idols get in us. They pull us away from him. We are more focused on on them than we are his will. Yes. Have you ever been bound by something after you've been a Christian and you've allowed things back in your life? Yeah. And you're thinking about that more than you're thinking about the Lord, are you not? Come on, somebody, help me out here. Y'all know what I'm talking about? If you've never done that, then just go ahead and trust me that it can happen. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I was a Christian for 12 years and I had an addiction to nicotine. I dipped that, I sucked that stuff dry. And let me tell you something, when my body was ready for some more, guess what happened? My, it was a little alarm was going off, and I wasn't thinking about Jesus. I was just thinking about the next dip I was going to stick in my lip. Nicotine will do it. Any kind of nicotine will do it. If there's an addiction behind it, it's not of the Lord. It's of, it's of the enemy. Yeah. It's another spirit of another kind. It, it, can be, it can be nicotine. It can be alcohol. It can be drugs. It can be lust. It can be relationships, money, materialism, music, and TV. It can be anything that gets in the way of our relationship with the Lord. Well, what are you saying, preacher? You don't want me to do nothing but come to your church and hear No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I want you and me to yield our hearts to him, to submit to him, and to allow him to cause our heart to beat for his will. That's what yes. I'm saying. Yeah. We'll let the Holy Spirit clean up the rest. Yes. Let the Holy Spirit show us what needs to be done, what needs to be taken out. Amen? Amen. He's not accepting anything else. Yeah. Well, I don't like that kind of preaching. <laughs> you won't be the first. <laughs> there have been others that have left for the kiddie pool of Christianity. That place where we wade around in waters up to our knees and splash and talk about how good it feels. Mm -hmm. And the preacher there says, we need to bring them along slowly. See, I'm talking about something that I know. I'm talking about something that I live. I'm not just talking about something that I read before. I have had conversations with multiple preachers. And listen to me, I'm not trying to pre pretend like I've got it all figured out. I'm some little overweight boy from South Louisiana. And there's a big old world of people out there, a big old world of preachers out there. Who do you think you are? I'll tell you who I think I am. I'm a man has been called by the Lord to preach his gospel and he told me present my word for the way that it is written and then I will use you. Don't put your grubby fingers in my word son. This is my word. My people have a right to hear it and let them respond to my word. You preach it for the way I wrote it. Let it come on out son. Yes. Yeah. They ain't going to all do it the same way. No preacher's going to all do it the same way. We're all different. This is just the way the Lord told me to do it. He said, this is my word presented for the way it's written. Let my word preach, tell my people the truth, and let them decide what they will do with it after that. But the new modern church movement isn't ever really going to disciple you in truth. Oh, they talk about discipleship. They talk about discipleship classes. We got all these meetings. We name them all of this kind of stuff. No, they're never really going to disciple you in truth. Instead, you will stay there in knee deep water and splash around and never grow. Just like waterlogged hands get wrinkled, your skin will wrinkle with age as the years go by. And you're sitting in that same church and wasting away. Yeah. I've heard some of what they've said. I'm talking about local preachers. It's not important who they are. I can only teach you a small portion of what I know because you can't handle all the things I know. We have to write it in crayon. We should teach it at a third grade level. Lies, control. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
without even knowing most preachers operate under a spirit of control. They themselves are under the control of another spirit and are being directed towards false doctrine that is spewed from their pulpits. And then the people are trapped underneath it. Their hearts long for more. Their spirits cry out for revelation. But most, like the prodigal son, just sit there and eat hog slop and remain sorrowful for their sin. God's not okay with that. This is what God will do. Point number one. You ready? God will make you new. Amen. God will make you new. Isaiah 43 verses 18 through 19. Isaiah 43 verses 18 through 19. Remember ye not the former things. Neither consider the things of old. Behold I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not, shall you not know it? It will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers. In the desert. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Israel was God's own people. He created them as a nation to bring him glory in response to his love for his people because God is love. He had promised them in Deuteronomy chapter 28. You obey me, there's a blessing. You disobey me, there's a curse. Instead, they rebelled and were disobedient. Also, the pri- and, and, be- and because they did the latter, there came a curse on their life. In this passage... Israel for many years had chosen the latter and the hand of God latter and the hand of God had been against them and in their weakness their enemy had overcome them and in their enemy's triumph they were in bondage but God will never quit on his plan for his people and in this Isaiah passage he promises to do a new thing he instructs them not to focus on the past And the path that had gotten them where they were, rather behold, look, and expect a new thing is coming. The context isn't here, a new thing for your flesh, as though he's here to bless something of you external. Let me say that again. The context here isn't a new thing for you externally. No, the context here is I'm going to do a new thing in you. I'm going to do a new thing on the inside of you. It's like the new covenant. It's like Jesus and the Holy Ghost springing up on the inside of you. He knew that for them it would seem impossible because there's times in our lives where we look at our circumstances and we wonder, how in the world did I get here and how will I get out? When God does it, it's like a spring that flows from the earth. And brings refreshing life. There are times when we will feel spiritually dehydrated. Have you ever felt dehydrated before? I was a little bit nervous when I wanted to go get some water. And we didn't have any water this morning. Sometimes like, all of a sudden it hits me. Like I didn't even realize it. But all of a sudden I started to feel dehydrated. You ever felt that way? You get weak. Almost weak in your knees. You know? And, 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 and it's like if I don't get some water on the inside of me quick. But then once I drink it, I'll guzzle it down. Sometimes you see me, I'll dip down two bottles of water. And then all of a sudden, slowly but surely, my veins fill up and I can feel it at the cellular level. Everything's starting to get itself right again. Spiritually, sometimes we find ourselves dehydrated, <laughs> weakened. Yes. And we know that if we don't, get, we don't get to the water, living water quickly, amen, and be strengthened again, we're, we're not going to make it. That's what it feels like, right? Spiritually, when God does a new thing in our lives, it feels like a refreshing spring of water. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Look what it says. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Turn your ways that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. A cooling, refreshing, a revival. I need a revival in my heart. John 7, 38 and 39. He that believes on me as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost has not, was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. See, lately the Lord's been kind of showing me this. The Lord's been showing me this about my own personal life and about the lives of believers. That when we get saved, the Holy Spirit is like a river of living water on the inside of us. You remember that day when you got saved? Or you remember times in your, in your walk when you felt the freshness of God? Every last person in here, if you've ever been saved, there's at least a moment in your life where you felt the freshness of God bubbling up like a spring of living. I remember one time when I was a teen, my mama sent me to my Uncle Nicky's house. 
for a summer because I was being bad. I was about 12, 13 years old. Yeah, I can't handle the boy. Take him. All right. So I go over there. I remember one day they said, where, where are we going, Uncle Nicky? Oh, we're going to a place called Magnolia Springs. I remember I jumped out of that boat into that water, man, and I could feel that cold water coming up. And, I, you know, I just think about that, 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 that the presence of the Lord is like a living water that's just bubbling up on the inside of us. But you know what the Lord's been showing me about my own personal life? What happens, though, is this, is that you start compromising. You open up a door and you allow a little bit of sin here, a little bit of sin there, a little bit of sin there. And you know what you're doing? You're letting the devil take shovels of dirt, <laughs> throwing it up on your springs of living water. And he's just over there clogging all that stuff up and it's not bubbling up and gushing up the way that it used to be. And that's what those choices of sin bring. And when we do it, once again, it prevents the gushing. But listen to me. If we will turn to him, he promises to do something new. He promises to bring life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Yes. Behold, all things are become new. That was point number one. God will make a new you. Amen. God will make you new. Point number two. The new you came at a price. We only got two points this morning. The new you came at a price. I want you to get that in your head. I one day need to remind myself of that. The name of the Lord needs to be glorified in the land. It was a high price so that all this could be done. Let's look at Leviticus 16 verses 5 through 10. This is Old Testament. This is Israel when they're about to enter into the promised land after the exodus, after the Red Sea was parted and God's giving them instruction on how to worship him. It says in verse five, and he said, he shall take of the congregation, talking about the priest, he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel, two kids of the goats. That means two baby goats or two ch young goats. For a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. The definition of scapegoat, scapegoat is the goat of departure. These goats weren't pets to be coddled. These goats were the harsh reality of God's answer for sin. The problem, once again, that we have in the modern church is that we have preachers that are passive on the subject of sin. I've been passive on the subject of sin before. Let's not be too loud about sin and the answer for it. Too much talk like this will make the people uncomfortable and they won't want to come back next week. Besides, people are made to feel uncomfortable when the preacher is too loud and boisterous. We want tranquility and softness because that is peace. I like the peace that I feel when the preacher says soft and pleasant words to me. I'm here to tell you that's not the word of the Lord. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 3 says that that's what an itchy ear is. An itchy ear really means that it likes pleasant words. That's not peace. See, that's just another lie. Come on, somebody. When you flip through the channels and you watch that preacher that's not really even preaching to God, I hope you can tell the difference. I'm not going to sit here today and list off a whole bunch of names. I've done it before. I'll do it again if the Lord leads me. But I don't know that it's necessary. Some of these people aren't even really, truly allowing the word of the Lord to go forth. Instead, what they're doing is a motivational speech. They're picking all kind of uh, scriptures and they're never going to speak a challenging word to try to challenge you and I or to try to wake us up and make us think that maybe we're not okay with the Lord. Instead, it's just a bunch of pleasant words that make us feel good. Listen to me. That's not not the way the word of the Lord is written. The word of the Lord challenges you and I to get our hearts right with him. And yes, whenever we do that, there's springs of refreshing water to come in. Hallelujah. Might make us uncomfortable, but listen, that's not peace. That's just another lie. Soft little pleasant words. I'm not saying everybody's got to be a loud preacher. That's not what I'm saying. 
But listen to me, it's just not like another pain pill. It's like the lie of religion. It's another spirit behind false doctrine that, that, that woos you to sleep. It's like another pain pill or another drink or another affair or another whatever made you feel good for a minute and made you forget your problems mo momentarily. Mm. And then whenever you walk out and you're faced with the situation again, there it is all over again. Mm -hmm. Let the truth be cried so that people can hear. Give God's people the opportunity to be uncomfortable with sin so that they may repent and their eyes be opened in which way to go. Don't tell me that it's against the word of the Lord for a preacher to preach the gospel boy and with boisterous, being boisterous. That's not true. I'm going to give you a scripture right here. Here it is, John chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, you know, maybe you feel like I'm over here trying to, 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 to make myself feel better. I'm just here to tell you. I've had people blast me on Facebook. I didn't make myself this way. God made me this way. I'm going to preach it the way he told me to preach it. I ain't going back to that church. The preacher was yelling. I ain't no preacher yelling at you, man. If anything, the preacher's yelling at the devil. He's not yelling at you. Don't let the devil lie to you. Amen. Look what it says. John 1.15. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spoke. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. You ready to hear what this word cried means? You ready for this? I loved it. It just, it just emboldened me. I'm like, Lord, make me louder today. <laughs> Can't just personally, purposefully preach loud just to get a point across. But look, this is what it means. Cry. To cry out. Look at this. The croak and the cry of a raven. To cry out aloud. Peace is when your soul is stirred, when the word of God is preached for the way it is written, and the Holy Spirit pricks your heart, and instead of clinging tightly to your sin and hardening your heart, you give it to God, and you release yourself into the hands of God. That's when true peace will come. Amen. Not some false, momentary peace, uh, lie of peace. No, true repentance and surrendering our heart to the Lord will allow grace to flow and produce a river of living water Hallelujah. on the inside of us. Hallelujah. We're talking about goats. We're talking about the scapegoat and the goat of sacrifice. And there's a difference between a goat and a sheep. Jesus fulfilled the role of both of these goats. And there's a big difference between the nature of goats and sheep. One difference is between goats and sheep is that is the way they act in the flock. Goats tend to be much more independent and they're curious and they wander outside the boundaries that are set for them. Whereas sheep, they like living in the midst of the flock. See, while independent and curious may seem like good qualities to have from a biblical perspective, what we should realize is that goats don't want to stay in the place where they belong. Does that offend you <laughs> when I say that to you? Because Lord knows that I got a head, I got a mind of my own. Amen. And sometimes I just want to go my own way. And I would just venture to say that I'm not the only one in here. Amen. I don't want to be told, don't you tell me what I got to do. Oh, don't you tell me how I got to act or something will rise up. I thank the Lord that he's starting to kill that in me. Hallelujah. Because I'm telling you right now, that didn't get me nowhere. Other than an old stubborn goat found myself lost in the wilderness and didn't know how to get back home. Lord, help me. <coughs> when Jesus took on the role of these two goats, he took upon him the role of the one who would deal with the, the goat nature of man, the sinfulness <sighs> of man. That prideful and obstinate part of man that wants to go in a direction that is opposite of where God wants us to live. Jesus took that upon himself so that it could be removed from us. This is the only way that God's character could be vindicated and his love expressed all at the same time. Man's fallen nature like a goat is in rebellion and opposition towards God. God will not have a relationship with rebellion. Therefore, in the sacrificial goat, God allowed the sinful and rebellious nature of man to be sacrificed through Jesus. And through the scapegoat, he removed that rebellion and sins of his people from his presence. Naya, can you come to the keyboard for me? See, this is how God made things new for us. This is justification. Spiritually, your sin was paid for and removed through the sacrifice of Jesus. I'm closing with this little statement here. The Father's plan is to bring glory to His name. Amen? Amen? He did it by offering something new. He offered the new covenant, which is Jesus. The sacrifice for sin. The remover of sin. And when that word is heard, and it's mixed with faith, the power of sin dies, 
the burden of sin is sent into the wilderness. The heart of man is changed. The spirit of God begins to gush up again like rivers of living water. That sinful dirt that was damming up and holding back the rivers of living water are broken down. And there is a refreshing. There is new life given. I venture to say that each and every last one of us in this house this morning know that there's an aspect in our life that we need the Lord to deal with.